We're so excited about this season and are happy that you all subscribed, so many of you, to support us in this endeavor. Um, we have a wonderful speaker today planned, uh, Chris Cuniff. Um, he is a friend and a fellow board member, and I don't know how we ever did without Chris, because he's been invaluable in the last few months on the board. He is originally from Long Island, New York, but has resided in the Charleston area for about 20 years. He studied economics and political science at Holy Cross College, then graduated from Harvard Law School in 1996. In 2004, he transitioned away from law practice and launched Harbor City Real Estate Advisors, a real estate brokerage company based in Mount Pleasant. To honor his growing interest in dreams and spirituality, Chris launched a second business, Lucid Coaching, in 2015. In his coaching practice, Chris seeks to blend his background in law and business with the intuition, wisdom, and creativity that he has gleaned from studying his dreams. Chris today will be exploring the science and spirituality of lucid dreaming. He'll review the Western sleep science behind lucid dreaming and the Tibetan Buddhist dream yoga tradition. Plus, he'll give examples of how Jungian-inspired lucid dreamers have used the lucid dream state to consciously dialogue with their shadow dream figures. If you'd like to know about what else Chris is up to, he has some wonderful meetups, one on lucid dreaming and one on Abraham Hicks. Well, actually two on Abraham Hicks. One is in Mount Pleasant and one in Somerville. I can vouch for these meetups. They're wonderful. You really deserve to go and find out for yourself how inspirational they can be. Um, if you want to find more, out more about um, these meetups, go to the homepage of lucidcoaching.com, and he will tell you when and where to meet. Again, it is my pleasure to present Chris Cunneth. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. So, are we on the wireless mic? Can you all hear me okay? Okay, great. Thank you. We're so pleased to have a good turnout for our first meeting of the year. Um, I want to start off by telling you that I had a lot of synchronicity, which is appropriate for a Jungian event, as I prepared for this lecture. The first element of synchronicity I had involved a dream. Um, most of you know who that is, is Jerry Seinfeld. And um, in my dream, I was in a venue just like this one, and I was getting ready to deliver a lecture just like this one, and I had the benefit of having a joke testing machine. It was backstage, and I could feed my joke into the machine, and then Jerry Seinfeld would appear on the computer, and he would tell my joke to a virtual audience, and I was really, really excited because my joke was an incredible hit and the, the laughter was just hysterical. Um, and then, you know, I woke up, and I thought, oh good, I'll have, you know, a joke for my presentation to the Young Society. And then I realized I couldn't remember the joke. And so I guess the joke was on me. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I had a second bit of synchronicity related to this. I was excited to order a new book by uh, Charlie Morley. It just came out earlier this year, and it's about the very topic of this presentation. It's, a, it's about the merger of lucid dreaming practice and Jungian psychology. And as I was reading the book, there was a section where he said, he was talking about lucid dream shadow integration. We'll get into that more later. Shadow integration basically means embracing the things that we normally repress or deny or push against especially in, in the context of nightmares. And he said, essentially, this practice is about doing the opposite of what we usually do when we meet our dream shadow. The dream shadow typically represents things that we are not willing to embrace about ourselves. 
And normally we run from it, we fight it, or we try to wake ourselves up from it. But the phrase that caught me was doing the opposite. Because immediately when I heard that phrase, I thought about Seinfeld. And there is a famous Seinfeld skit about that phrase, doing the opposite. And hopefully, I'll be able to pull it up here. Bear with me one moment. Can we hear that? Actually, we can't hear that, can we? we? All right, well, we were a little late getting ready for this presentation, so I'm going to have to give you the gist of it without playing the, the video for you. Hold on one second. So in this uh, episode of Seinfeld, George dis discovers the fact that everything he's ever done in his life has been wrong. And so he decides he's going to do the exact opposite of everything he's ever done in his life. So the waitress comes over and asks and says this typical sandwich order that he typically orders. And he has a sudden realization, no, I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to order the opposite sandwich of that. And then Elaine eggs him on because she says, hey, George, that woman just looked over at you. And he says, Elaine, a man who lives with his parents and is, has, is balding, does not approach strange women. And Jerry offers to him the advice, well, here's your chance to do the opposite. And he goes up to the woman, inspired by the whole idea of doing the opposite. And when he gets up to the woman, he says, hi, my name is George. I'm balding. I live at home with my parents. <laughs> and she is absolutely thrilled to meet him. So... <clears throat> So it ends up being a successful endeavor for George. So the idea of doing the opposite, since it appeared in both the Seinfeld context and in my, the book I was reading about Charlie Morley, I decided that I think synchronicity has just delivered to me a theme that I could use for my talk to the Young Society. And there's a couple of, there's an image of George talking to the woman. So give me one second here, we'll get this. Okay, now we're back on track here. So I got inspired to create this framework about doing the opposite. And I created this little chart. On the left-hand side of the chart are gonna be four different ideas. These are ideas that we tend to borrow from mass consciousness. And when I say mass consciousness, I just mean there's a stream of thought, a dominant theory about how we should live, what we should believe, et cetera. And I'm going to challenge us to say, hey, if that's the dominant thought, maybe we should consider doing the opposite. So I'm going to start with a relatively easy one, which is one of the ideas we get from mass consciousness is that dreams are meaningless and they're not worth the effort to remember. Well, some of the folks in the scientific community, that's sort of the, the, the perspective they have on dreaming. It's the random firing of neurons, and it's basically you know, nonsense bubbling up from the unconscious. And so if we were to challenge that idea, the opposite would be that dreams are meaningful, that they are worth remembering, and that they're worth honoring. And one of the things you're going to discover about this chart I've created is it's really just an excuse for me to be able to talk about things I want to talk about. So I've sort of posed questions for myself to answer. And since I'm talking to a group of people interested in Jungian psychology, it's not too much of a stretch that some of you, at least, are open to the idea that dreams are meaningful. But I also wanted to take this as an opportunity to sort of explain what I'm doing here in the first place today. Why is a person who you learned in my introduction, I really have a background in law, in business, in real estate, how is it that I came to be delivering a lecture to the Jung Society? And it has to do with a meaningful dream I had a few years ago. 
So in my dream, I'm at a concert. And my perspective shifts during this concert. Initially, I'm sort of in the audience like this with this perspective looking on the stage. At later times, I'm out by the concession area. And later in the dream, I sort of have an aerial view of the crowd. But the main thing that was clear about this dream is that it was a Milli Vanilli concert. <laughs> now, most of you are vaguely familiar, at least, with Milli Vanilli. And this is sort of an odd dream to have for me because I'm not really a big fan of Milli Vanilli. Um, they're actually best known for the fact that they won a Grammy Award in 1990 for being the best new artist. And they're only later to have their Grammy reward revoked when it turned out that these two guys were lip syncing the music. And actually, there were two, some other artists who were the actual singers of the work. So as a dream symbol, they're sort of interesting, right? This is the main act of this concert I'm at. And there's an element here where they may represent something connected with insincerity or fraud even. But something else about this dream was that there was a side act. Some of you know who that is. That's Sammy Hagar. He's the former lead singer of Van Halen. And for some people, Sammy Hagar might be just as cheesy as Millie Vanilli. But this is why dream interpretation is very individual, because if there's six billion people on the planet, there really ought to be six billion dream dictionaries. Because Sammy Hagar represents something very unique to me, which is that I'm a huge Sammy Hagar fan. <laughs> I'm a child of the 1980s. I, I went to Van Halen concerts when they were on top of the world. And Sammy Hagar, to me, he represents the idea of singing your heart out, to giving everything you have to your audience, to laying it all on the line. He represents the idea of unfiltered self-expression. So this is an interesting juxtaposition. This is what dreams often, a tool that dreams often use. They juxtapose two different ideas side by side. And here, the idea was that the main act of my concert is Milli Vanilli, something related to insincerity, perhaps, or a false front, and that I only have a supporting act that represents my true unfiltered self-expression. Something else happened in this dream at the end, which is I got an aerial view of the crowd. And I thought I did a pretty good job. I'm not a professional Photoshop user, but I created that little arrow in the crowd. And in my dream, the, the crowd started to part in the center. And where the crowd had parted, the empty space took the form of an arrow. And the arrow was just like this, pointing toward the stage. And it was when I finally had the time to digest and interpret this dream, I understood it to be an invitation to me. Because there was something going on my, on my life that was a false front. Which is that, at the time, I had developed a very strong interest in dreams and a very strong interest in spirituality. And I kept that interest solely to myself, and maybe a few people. My wife knew about it and a few other people in my life. But I was not out there expressing myself. I was telling the world that I'm a real estate guy and I'm a lawyer. And so I was putting the Milli Vanilli thing out there as my main act. And this was an invitation for me to change and consider some of the things I had been thinking about, like creating a coaching business, or starting a blog, or speaking publicly. So today, I'm pleased I'm honoring this dream today because one of the things you'll notice about um, Sammy Hagar is he's wearing a red shirt. And in fact, he is, one of his nicknames is he's called the Red Rocker. And so I wear my red shirt today because today I am trying to honor my inner rock star um, and this is an interesting element of, of, of shadow work because we tend to think of the shadow as something negative, something that we're repressing like in a nightmare, something that has a very negative connotation. But often the shadow is a golden shadow. It's an element of yourself that is just waiting to be uncovered and it is seeking expression. And <clears throat> paying attention to your dreams is one way to uncover those aspects. 
So let me introduce a second idea, which will serve the purposes of my presentation. And that is the idea that mass consciousness gives us the dominant belief that sleep is a time when we lose consciousness. That basically we go about our day, we work hard, we play hard, and then we basically just crash. We just go for six or eight hours where we basically just tune out altogether. And we wake up in the morning, a small percentage of our population will have some recollection of their dreams, but a large part of our population will have no recollection whatsoever of what happened to them over the last six or eight hours. There's sort of a disconnection between their waking life and their sleep life. So what would be doing the opposite of that? Well, that would be to view sleep as an opportunity to stretch and expand consciousness. And this is also my excuse to introduce you to the topic of lucid dreaming. Because lucid dreaming is exactly that. It's an opportunity to take the consciousness we normally associate with our wake state and to bridge it and connect it over to our sleep state. So there's a lot of different definitions about lucid dreaming. People sometimes ask me, what exactly is a lucid dream? So sometimes it's easier to talk about it in terms of what a lucid dream is not. And Robert Wagner is one of my favorite teachers of lucid dreaming. If I have to recommend one book to you on lucid dreaming, it would be Robert's book, Lucid Dreaming, Gateway to the Inner Self. And Robert tells us that lucid dreaming does not equal control. Some people think lucid dreaming means controlling your dreams. But this is a great analogy. Robert tells us no sailor controls the sea. Only a foolish sailor would say such a thing. Similarly, no lucid dreamer controls the dream. Like a sailor on the sea, we lucid dreamers direct our perceptual awareness within the larger state of dreaming. Robert actually came up with that primarily because he found himself at dream conferences talking with a lot of dreamers who had a Jungian perspective and they were saying, hey, we don't like this whole lucid dreaming idea because we think we're supposed to be receiving information from the unconscious. And um, that's one of the things I wanted to spell today is that lucid dreaming is not about trying to tell the unconscious what to do. It's actually attempting to open up uh, to sort of increase the pipeline, to increase the information flow coming in from the unconscious by having some awareness in the dream state. Another idea with lucid dreaming to think about is that it's not a black and white thing. It's not like either you're lucid or you're not lucid. It's better to think of it as a sliding scale. And there are different degrees of lucidity that can happen in a dream. So for instance, just about everybody has had a lucid dream because just about everybody has had this dream where you're having a nightmare and you have a brief moment where you realize it is a nightmare. And you choose to wake yourself up from the nightmare. And so even though that's not exactly putting your lucidity to work, it is an element of lucidity in the dream. There is some awareness there. And as we go through this presentation, we'll see some examples of even you know, greater degrees of awareness that can be exercised in the dream. So I wanna give you just a little brief overview of the history of lucid dreaming. Uh, first, to give you a little bit of a, sort of the Western perspective on lucid dreaming. Uh, the earliest lucid dream written record we have goes back to St. Augustine, back in uh, about around 400 AD, but that is sort of just a brief reference in the literature. He describes a dream where the dreamer is aware that his body is asleep and he is dreaming. In terms of actual, a text that actually studies lucid dreaming, there's a Frenchman, Hervé de Saint-Denis, and he has a book written in 1867 where he uh, basically did a self-study of his own dreams, and he had numerous examples of lucid dreams. He describes these dreams, he defines these dreams as dreams in which the dreamer is perfectly aware that he is dreaming. So that's one pretty good working definition of what a lucid dream is. The phrase lucid dreaming itself, we got from Frederick Van Eden. Uh, Van Eden was a Dutch psychiatrist. He was something of a Renaissance man. He was also a novelist and a playwright. 
And he coined the phrase lucid dreaming. And like St. Dennis, he had done a self-study of dreams. And he describes, he defines these dreams as dreams in which the sleeper remembers his day life and his own condition, reaches a state of perfect awareness, and is able to direct his attention and to attempt different acts of free, free volition. Yet the sleep, as I'm confidently able to state, is undisturbed, deep, and refreshing. And I like Van Eden as a model for myself because I like the idea of being able to be a real estate guy and also someone interested in dreams. And he, if he could be a playwright and someone who self-studies his dream, then he's a good model. Those examples are all from the Western tradition of Western culture. But I wanted to point out just briefly at the beginning here that there's a long tradition in Tibetan Buddhism of lucid dreaming. It goes back over a thousand years. And um, so I don't want to have it be left on the table as if it's a Western concept, because it's the, the, the practice in the East is actually more well-developed historically. And we're going to get into that a little bit more toward the end of my presentation. So let's talk a little bit about the science of lucid dreaming. Um, most of you are familiar to some degree with the idea of rapid eye movement sleep. So rapid eye movement sleep was first identified by sleep scientists back in the early 1950s. And on this chart here, that's indicated in red. A Couple things to note about rapid eye movement sleep is that in sleep studies, that's the period of, of sleep that's most cl closely associated with dreams. So they would, in these sleep studies, they wake people up at various stages of sleep. And it was most often in, that they'd find the, the person, the subject was dreaming, it was usually during REM sleep. The chart shows us something else, which is that early in the night, we take deep dives. We usually take one or two deep dives into stage four sleep. Stage four sleep is basically the way they define that is they, it, your, your, your brain wave activity slows down. And then you come back up for a brief period of REM sleep. And then as the night progresses, those periods of REM sleep become longer and longer. So this tells us that if you want to practice lucid dreaming, you might want to pay attention to the hours later in the morning, closer to when you're waking, because that's when you have longer periods of REM sleep. Prior to the 1970s, lucid dreaming was basically entirely based on subjective reports. In other words, there was no way to prove that these dreams were happening, and, and, and that led to a lot of skepticism. A lot of people would say, well, these, can't, these reports are just nonsense, the people being awake during their dreams. But in the late 1970s, two researchers, in, acting independently, conducted the same experiment. Uh, Keith Hearn on the right was the first dream researcher to conduct this eye signal experiment. Stephen LeBurge, uh, Hearn is based in England. Stephen LeBurge is based in California, was based at Stanford. And they both basically acted on a hunch. One of the things that happens during REM sleep, which is most closely associated with dreaming, is that your body goes into full paralysis. Your entire body is, is paralyzed. And there's an evolutionary reason for that, which is that prevents your body from acting out the action of the dream. But they thought maybe there might be a couple exceptions to that. LeBurge had been around some studies where they, in one incident, they woke up a subject because the subject was in rapid eye movement sleep, but suddenly, instead of being the random eye movement, his eyes began to move in a more distinct pattern. And so they decided to wake him up and asked, hey, what were you dreaming? Were you dreaming? What were you dreaming about? He said, yeah, I was dreaming about a ping pong match. And that's why his eyes were moving more deliberately back and forth. So that gave LeBurge the idea, well, maybe that's a tell. Maybe your whole body is paralyzed, but your eyes somehow might not be. Um, and so in the sleep lab, they were able to basically have the, all the scientific, ins scientific instruments prove that the body is asleep. They can do this by measuring your skin electricity and the, 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 the electrical potential of your muscles and your, the, the typical movement of your eyes. And while the body has all the signs of being in deep, you know, in REM sleep, 
the subject is able to send a signal from the dream state by sending, but in the dream state making deliberate eye movements back and forth that would register on the electrodes in the sleep lab. So that sort of gave credibility to the idea of lucid dreaming. Um, because before that, it would have been entirely based on subject subjective reports. So what's the point of learning lucid dreaming? Well, there are lots of different applications. We're going to get into some of them in this presentation. Um, it could be as simple as wanting to explore the dream space, uh, uh, practice some wish fulfillment. For instance, you know, when I was, uh, to this day, I, I'm six foot two, I can not quite slam dunk a basketball because I'm just, I can touch the rim. But in some lucid dreams, I've been able to go up there and slam the basketball. That's not something you can do in waking life. People like to fly in their dreams. Um, some people like to use the lucid dream state to rehearse waking life scenarios. I had the chance, Ann and I, my wife had a chance to go to California, I'm sorry, go to uh, Hawaii for a workshop on lucid dreaming a few years ago. And we met a guy who was a DJ. And he was a lucid dreamer. And he told me that he would practice being a DJ in his lucid dreams. He started out playing smaller venues in his dreams. And then he would basically work his way up to bigger and bigger venues in the dream state and get the sense of the feel and the vibration of playing before those larger and larger audiences. And then this, this became mimicked in his waking life because he began to be get larger and larger gigs. A lot of athletes use lucid dreaming to practice. If you're a skier or if you're uh, a, a ice skater, you might be able to practice your maneuvers. Scientists have found that the neuron patterns, when you, neurons that fire together in the dream state become more habituated to firing together in the wake state. Some people will use lucid dreaming for spiritual practice. We're going to talk later about the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, and one of the things they do in that tradition is that they will practice meditating in the dream state. And the last item is one of the more practical applications of lucid dreaming is for the resolution of nightmares. And that actually is going to be my next bullet point. Am I doing the opposite chart? Mass consciousness tells us that we should fear and avoid nightmares. We get some of this from the Freudian worldview, which is that the unconscious contains some of the more unsavory elements of our psyche, and that we may not want to interact with these unsavory elements. It's better to sort of lock that basement door. And we get this from some of our movies which make us fear the unconscious and encountering with the unconscious. So if we were to take the approach of doing the opposite, we would embrace nightmares. We would embrace the idea of doing so-called shadow work. We would want to interact with those aspects of ourselves that we ordinarily repress, that we ordinarily deny. So we'll go into some examples of that. I briefly introduced you earlier to Charlie Morley, and I want to just bring up his quote again. Because he says that normally when we meet our dream shadow, we run from it, we fight it, or we wake ourselves up from it. Charlie, one of the best things about his approach to teaching dreams is he's very self-deprecating. And he tells a story in his book how he's been trained He's been training as a Buddhist for a long time, since he was in his teenage years. And in his early 20s, he was learning how to meditate in the dream state. So he'd become aware during the dream, and then he would meditate. And then sometimes a shadow figure would approach him and interrupt his meditation. So he says at that point in his life, he would turn himself into a giant, and he would chop the shadow figure into pieces. <laughs> and... At the time, he thought he was being a good Buddhist because he could then return to his meditation. So he told his meditation teacher about this habit he had formed of chopping up his shadow figures as they interrupted his meditations in the dream. And his, his, his meditation teacher, of course, was alarmed and said, no, 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 you don't understand. You need to embrace your shadow. So 
The next time he encountered a shadow figure in his dream, he actually hugged the shadow figure. And when he reported that back to his teacher, the, the teacher said, I didn't mean for you to literally embrace your shadow. I meant, I meant you need to dialogue with your shadow figure. You need to find out what they represent. You need to uh, engage with the shadow figure. So um, he's an entertaining guy to, to read and, and listen to. He's got some great videos out there as well. So if we ordinarily run from our shadow figure, fight our shadow figure, and wake ourselves up from it, we need to think about what else we could do. And I have to make a confession, which is that my favorite way to deal with dream figures when I don't have awareness is to drop kick them. I have, um, I'd have never done a drop kick in waking life, but I will get a running start, I'll throw both legs up in the air, and I will take out the shadow figure. That is my go-to method when I'm not lucid and I'm not aware, when I have that immediate emotional reaction to something that startles me or frightens me or that I don't want to have in my dream. Um, that's Jumping Joe Savoldi. He was a Notre Dame football player who got into professional wrestling and patented the drop kick. So let's talk about some other approaches. So we're not attacking our dream figures, we're not running away from them, and we're not just deciding to wake ourselves up from our dream. Stephen LeBurge, in addition to being a leading lucid dream scientific researcher, he's also a prolific lucid dreamer. Matter of fact, in his studies that he did in the 1970s, he was both the scientist and the person falling asleep having the dreams. And so he's probably had more lucid dreams than anyone else around. And when uh, we, we went to his workshop, he told us the story about a very important dream he had having to do with shadow work. He is climbing down the outside of a building, sort of like have a, as I have pictured here. He said it was sort of like being like Spider-Man because he was escaping from some forgotten danger. He didn't even know what he was running from, but he was going to get away from it. And he sort of realizes the ridiculousness of the situation that he's climbing down the side of a building. And he decide, he become, and that causes him to become, he says, oh, wait a minute, this is a dream. And so I, can, I don't need to worry about climbing down this building, I can just fly. And he happily flies away from the scene. But just like Robert Wagner told us earlier that the dreamer is like the sailor, the sailor does not control the, the, the sea, this is a good example of how the dreamer does not control the dream. Because initially he starts flying, but then nothing to do with his control, the scene changes, and he's in a classroom. And he's listening to an eminent Sufi teacher. Uh, it was a teacher that he respected, Indrez Shah, and who represented, certainly here in this dream, it's an inner guide coming forth. And the teacher says to the class, well, it was good that Stephen realized that he was dreaming and he could fly, but too bad. He didn't see that because it was only a dream, there was no need to escape, and there was no need to flee. And LeBurge sort of almost felt embarrassed by the dream lecture. And it became sort of a turning point in his experience with lucid dreaming because he resolved after that dream that he was never going to use his lucidity to avoid a situation. That that wasn't what his inner calling was pushing him toward. So lots of people have been influenced by LeBurge. LeBurge has taught a lot of techniques about lucid dreaming. I'm not really going to spend the lecture time talking about lucid dream techniques in the question and answer period. If we want to get into that, that's something we can do. But briefly, one of the techniques that LeBurge teaches is basically a visualization technique. So if you have a recurring nightmare, you can, before you go back to sleep, you can visualize yourself back in that nightmare. And if you normally in the nightmare would attack the dream figure or run away from the dream figure or wake yourself up, wake yourself up from the dream, you can in your visualization rehearse doing something else, like engaging the dream figure in conversation. So a lot of people go to Stephen's workshops, and one of the guys that went to one of his workshops was an author out of Philadelphia named Steve Volk, who wrote an interesting book called Fringeology. 
And Steve was interested in studying some of these areas that at least are perceived as on the bubble between respectable science and pseudoscience. And he thought lucid dreaming might be one of those areas that's sort of on the bubble. And he was also had a history of having a recurring nightmare. And he figured, well, what better way I could kill two birds? I could study this area for my book. And I might be able to do some work with my recurring nightmare. And so he tells us that he's had a he had, was experiencing a recurring nightmare that happened to him about six times per year for 20 years. And in this dream, he encountered a, a shadow figure that he would just simply call was like the boogeyman. And the boogeyman would show up, he'd be at his apartment, and the boogeyman would appear in the window with a very menacing face. And then the face would shift to one of the other windows, and then to a third window. And he could feel the fear bubbling up within him. And then the shadow figure would come around to the front door and open the door. And then he would do one of the things that Charlie Morley tells us we want to try to get away from. He would always engage the shadow figure in a fight. And they would start rolling around on the floor together, uh, uh, punching each other, rolling around, wrestling each other. And then he would eventually wake up from the dream. So he used LeBurge's visualization method. And before he would go to sleep, he would visualize himself back in this dream. He'd see the guy's face showing up in the window. And he would practice seeing if he could have some sort of diff different reaction. Initially, he thought, well, maybe I'll end up having a conversation with this guy. But then he was somewhat startled that this actually worked. And he found himself back in this nightmare. But this time, he was aware that he was dreaming. And he was aware that no harm could come to him. He saw the dream figure appear in the windows, as usual. And then the boogeyman shows up at the door. And he kept repeating to himself, this is just a dream. No harm can come to me. And the boogeyman wanted to take things a little bit deeper. So when he didn't react to start wrestling with him, the boogeyman took out a gun and pointed it directly at Steve in the dream. And Steve repeated to himself, this is just a dream. No harm can come to me in this dream. That didn't stop the boogeyman from firing the gun right at his chest. And he looked down at his chest, and he saw the bullets sort of just passing through him like his body was a cloud. He didn't feel any pain or anything like that. He was somewhat amazed. He sort of felt like Superman, felt like he was invincible. And he looked back at the boogeyman figure, and the boogeyman figure just smiled and then walked away. So this is an interesting dream because he didn't do anything other than passively really experience the dream. And so lucid awareness does not mean trying to control the dream. It just means experiencing the dream with a higher degree of awareness so that you don't do the things that Charlie talks about. You don't run away, you don't attack, and you don't wake yourself up. And the, the result of this experience for Steve was that he never, ever experienced that nightmare again. At least at the time of the writing of his book, he'd gone several years, and the dream had stopped happening to him. And this is something that's commonly reported with people that use lucid dreaming for working with nightmares. Another example of this is Paul Foley. Paul is a German lucid dream researcher. And he was, um, he's been doing lucid dream work you know, going back to the 60s and 70s. He had a recurring nightmare where he was being chased by a tiger. And he learned lucid dreaming. And so he, he finally got into a, a situation where he was trying to think, if I get back in that lucid dream where the tiger's chasing me, I'm, I'm going to realize that it's just a dream. I don't need to keep running away from the tiger. So this happens in one of his dreams. He says, I pulled myself together. I stood my ground and I asked the tiger, who are you? So he asks an open-ended question. In a sense, he's following Robert Wagner's advice because he's not trying to control the dream. He leaves the pipeline open for information to flow through by asking an open-ended question. Who are you? 
The tiger was taken aback by my question, but then transformed into my father. And he answered, I am your father, and I will now tell you what to do. And as you may surmise, he had a somewhat rocky relationship with his father. And it was one where his father was always telling him what to do and disapproving of his son. As a matter of fact, he confesses that even when in other dreams where he became lucid and he encountered his father, he would normally use his lucidity to attack his father because that was something he wanted to do. He was, had so much anger and unresolved, so many unresolved issues with his father. But in this case, in contrast to my earlier dreams, I did not attempt to beat him, <laughs> but I attempted to get into dialogue with him. And he has a constructive dialogue with his father. It's not as if he accepted all of his father's criticisms, but he does have a constructive dialogue with him. And at the end of the conversation, my father seemed to slip into my own body, and I remained alone in the dream. And after this experience, he says his father never again appeared in his dreams as a threatening dream figure. So similar to Steve Volk, the recurring nightmare comes to an end through the application of lucid awareness. And I have one last example of this practice, which comes from our friend Robert Wagner. Before Robert wrote his book on lucid dreaming, it was an idea that he had bouncing around, but um, he decided it was just too much work. It was too much of a project. He wasn't really sure if there's really an audience interested in lucid dreaming to justify all the time and effort until he had this dream where he encounters a woman that's behind him. And I say he encounters the woman that's behind him because this woman behind him is pulsating with energy. And he had learned at that point with his lucid dreaming practice that often where the energy is in the dream, that's often where you want to go. You want to find out what that energy is about. So he senses this strong pulsating energy behind him in the form of a, a young woman. And he turns around. He's so interested in finding out what she's about, he actually picks her up and puts her in front of him, like on a table. And he asks her, importantly, an open-ended question. Who are you? Who are you? And the woman unexpectedly responds, I am a discarded aspect of yourself. And he didn't initially know what she was referring to, but he did immediately sense that there was truth in her statement, and he felt the need to reintegrate this woman into his being. So as he stood in front of her with accepting energy, she seemed to evaporate into me as a brief wisp of energy that just sort of gets sucked into him. And that's very similar to what Paul Foley described with his father, how the energy that he had been denying or repressing, he now engaged with, and then at the end of the dream, he seems to receive the energy, sort of merges with the energy. And after this lucid dream, when he was back in the wake state, he could suddenly feel new ideas and positive emotions about writing that lucid dreaming book. All the doubts that he had surrounding his goal of writing the book has seemingly crumbled. He went to work very actively after this dream in working on the book. So she represented, I think, an inner aspect of him that was the writer, that was the, similar to my sort of Sammy Hagar figure, right? It was that part of him that was seeking to express what he was passionate about, that he had been denying, that he had not been allowing into his life. And so this lucid dream created the opening for him to stop denying the energy and allow it to flow more into his life. So before I introduce my final of my four bullet points, I want to tell you about a dream I had involving my two cats. Those are my two cats, Tigger on the left and Shadow on the right. Shadow is still with us. He's 16 years old now. Tigger transitioned out of this reality about five years ago. And the reason I want to introduce this dream to you is because the first three points on my chart had to do with talking about 
dreams. And this last one has to do more about talking about this reality that we all share together, this waking reality. And I've had a, I've had a couple of dreams that have sort of shaped me in terms of how I think about waking life. So this was a lucid dream. And in this lucid dream, I'm in the house that I lived in at the time I had the dream. It's very similar to the house I was living in. Tigger, by that point, had passed on. But in my dream, I see Tigger scamper across the room. And when I see Tigger, I realize, oh, this is a dream. And I become lucid. And my wife, Anne, is in the dream. And I tell her excitedly, I'm having a lucid dream. <laughs> For whatever reason, I feel it's important. I don't know whether that's really Anne in my dream or my projection of Anne. But at the time, I felt I should tell her, hey, I'm having a lucid dream. And she's sort of like, OK, have fun, you know. So this was a strong lucid dream for me when we talk about that sliding scale of lucidity. Because in addition to becoming lucid, which was exciting, and being able to interact with Tigger, which was exciting, I also was able to remember one of my items on my lucid dream to-do list. So some of us lucid dreamers, we have a little list of things, experiments that we want to run if we become lucid in a dream. So I had read about these you know, Tibetan Buddhists and such, these people that do spiritual practice in their dream, and they practice meditating in the dream. And they say that the meditation in the dream state is like 10 times more powerful than the meditation that you do in waking life. So I was like, oh, I'm going to meditate in this dream. And I go down the hallway into the bedroom. The bedroom is just like it is laid out in my waking house. And I sit in something of a lotus posture on my bed. Tigger and Shadow, they jump up on the bed with me. I'm excited. Well, they'll curl up with me. We'll meditate together. And I close my eyes, and I attempt to try to meditate. But just like meditation and waking life, the problem is you're often distracted by your pesky thoughts. And when I close my eyes, I'm distracted by one thought, which is, wait a minute, I'm in a dream and I just close my eyes, what happens if I open my eyes? Am I still in the same room? Or will I be meditating on a mountaintop? Like, what will happen if I open my eyes? And so I do open my eyes, because I can't resist the curiosity, and I'm still in the bedroom, except Tigger and Shadow are not there. And wait a minute, I'm not in the lotus posture, posture anymore. I'm lying on my back. And wait a minute, oh wait, I'm back I'm in the reality, I'm back in waking reality, you know. I'm woken up from my dream. But it was very surreal because the room in the dream was so real and the room in waking life was, didn't really feel any different. And it took me a few minutes to be sure that I was really in waking life. And then I fell back asleep because it was early in the morning. And I entered into another dream. This one was not a lucid dream. And I was at a restaurant with some guy friends. And I was telling them about my amazing experience where I, I closed my eyes in one room that was a bedroom. And I woke up in another room that was a bedroom in this sort of like confusion over waking and sleeping. And they were very dismissive. They're like, Chris, come on now. This is it's just a dream. Just stop, stop getting all worked up about this. And I told them, I said, if that was a dream, then this restaurant is a dream. But... I wasn't lucid. I actually thought I was in waking life. And then I woke up and realized, oh, that was a dream, you know, which just furthered my confusion over what my reality was. <laughs> so this is a pattern that I've experienced with my lucid dreams. It's an element of reality confusion over what is real and what isn't. I've... Uh, had another dream where I was interacting with a relationship partner. In this dream, I was a gay man. And that may seem unusual that, because in this life I'm, um, I'm not gay, but that's not too unusual for me because I'm used to seeing myself in different roles in my dreams. I've looked in a dream mirror once and seen my facial features as Japanese facial features. I've been a woman many times in my dreams. Um, I've been a much younger man many times in my dreams. But in this particular dream, 
I'm working through some relationship issues in this gay relationship. And I'm coming to the conclusion that this guy's just not that into me. And it's not an easy decision, but I'm going to have to end the relationship. And then I wake up. And I tell Anne about the dream. And she's actually really interested in the dream. And she's like giving me lots of advice about how I can handle the situation. But she's not actually like talking about it as, as if it's a dream. She's saying, like, as if I'm going to be re-entering that relationship and I'm going to need her advice about how to deal with it properly. And so I, I, we have a nice conversation about it. And then I woke up from that dream. And I woke up in this reality. And I found myself once again somewhat startled and wondering, you know, which reality is which. So this has led me to think of reality in maybe an unconventional way compared to the way mass consciousness looks at reality. One metaphor might be a Ferris wheel. I'm borrowing this one from Jane Roberts, who's the author of the Seth material. And in this model of reality, the soul is at the center of the Ferris wheel, at the hub of the Ferris wheel, and that each bucket of the Ferris wheel represents a different reality experience that that soul is having at any given time, or maybe having them all simultaneously. And when we dream, we can follow these little lines that go into the hub, and we can get peaks of experience that are going on in other buckets. So that's an idea that I entertain quite a bit. And I think that's one of the ways to approach what in some religious traditions is called reincarnation, which I tend to think now is more like the idea of parallel lives. Or another metaphor would be the idea of the television. It's, 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 it's a something we're accustomed to. We can flip the channels pretty quickly. So maybe from the perspective of the soul or the inner self, it's like looking simultaneously at a bank of different experiences and, and able to dip in and out of those experiences. So this leads me to my fourth item, taking an idea from mass consciousness and challenging it. And this idea is having to do with waking life. And that idea is that unlike dreams, physical reality is solid, permanent, and objective. It is permanent and objective in the sense that it is separate from the observer. So Gage Hall, mass consciousness tells us this Gage Hall exists as an objective object in physical reality. When we all leave here today, Gage Hall will still be here, right? regardless of anyone experiencing it. What would be the opposite of that? The opposite of that would be to say that just like dreams, physical reality is fluid, temporary, and subjective. That this reality is intimately connected with the observer, just as it is in dreams. And some of you might be thinking, well, that's sort of a lucid dreaming idea. That's not really a Jungian idea. And this is supposed to be about lucid and Jungian. And you might even say, well, up to this point in your lecture, Chris, you haven't even quoted Carl Jung one time. You're supposed to be talking about both lucid dreaming and Jungian ideas. You're mostly talking about lucid dreaming. Well, I say, don't worry. I knew that this last point would require the most ammunition it would be the most challenging to our consciousness. So I saved the old master for my finale. Because Carl Jung thought about this idea quite a bit as well. And in his great autobiography, Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, he tells us about two dreams he had that caused him to reverse the way he, 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 he thinks, he think, led him to think that mass consciousness has things backwards. I'm only going to get into one of the dreams because of time constraints. And in this dream, he comes to a small wayside chapel. The door is ajar, and he goes into the chapel. He sees that on the floor, in front of the altar, facing me, is a yogi sitting in lotus posture, and it's, the yogi is deep in meditation. 
But when he looks more closely at the yogi, he realizes that the yogi's face is his own face. And this is quite startling to him. And he had this dream in 1944. When he wakes up from the dream, he has sort of an aha moment. He says, aha, the yogi, he is the one who is meditating me. He has a dream, and I am it. He says, he goes on, this is a parable. Myself, which is Jung's word, he, he typically is referring to the idea of what we more, more commonly say, the soul. Myself or my soul retires into meditation and meditates my earthly form. To put it another way, my soul assumes human shape in order to enter three-dimensional existence as if someone were putting on a diver suit in order to dive into the sea. And here is where he comes as if by, you know, great providence, he knew the theme of my lecture was doing the opposite. He says, the aim of both of these dreams is to effect a reversal, the opposite of the relationship between ego consciousness and the unconscious, and to represent the unconscious as the generator of the empirical personality. So rather than the personality being the one who has a dream experience, we are the ones being dreamed. This reversal suggests our unconscious existence is the real one, and our conscious world a kind of illusion, an apparent reality, constructed for a specific purpose, like a dream, which seems a reality as long as we are in it. It is clear that the state of affairs resembles very closely the oriental conception of Maya. And here at the end of his statement here, he's basically saying, although this came to me spontaneously in a dream, and because he's Carl Jung, he doesn't need to rely upon any outsiders to tell him anything. It all comes from within. He acknowledged he's not the first guy to come up with this idea that, in fact, Hinduism has a long history of viewing the world in just this way. The concept of Maya comes from Hinduism, and really there are a dozen different schools of Hinduism, and each one of them has a different take exactly on what Maya means. But Yogananda, in his great book, Autobiography of a Yogi, he was really the one responsible for introducing Hindu thought to the, to the Western culture. You know, one of his quotes is, you are walking on earth as in a dream. Our world is a dream within a dream. And although this has a long history in Hinduism, the Buddhists took this idea probably the furthest in terms of an exploration point. Because they got very interested, going back for over a thousand years, in what is going on in the dream state. And how do we explore consciousness by exploring the dream state with lucid awareness? I've got some books here. And by the way, any of the books that I've referenced in my lecture, if you go to my website, lucidcoaching.com, I have a page called Faculty Lounge, and I have all my favorite books listed there, and you can find titles and authors there. In the couple minutes we have left, I want to just briefly introduce Tibetan dream yoga. One idea to have in mind about what dream yoga is about, and by the way, it's not about doing yoga in the dream state. That would be fun to do, just like doing meditation in the dream state. But it's more of a metaphor, just as physical. This is Andrew Holacek, who's a Westerner, but uh, he's one of the leading researchers and teachers of Buddhism and dream yoga. Just as physical yoga makes your body more flexible, dream yoga makes your mind more flexible. Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche, who wrote a fantastic book called The Tibetan Yogas of Dream and Sleep, he puts it this way. He wants us to think about the idea that we're dreaming all the time. We're dreaming at night and we're dreaming during the day as well. He says, normally, dream is thought to be unreal as opposed to real waking life. But there is nothing more real than dream. This statement only makes sense when it, once it is understood that normal waking life is, is as unreal as dream. Dream yoga applies to all experience, to the dreams of the day and to the dreams of the night. So he's telling us that the Buddhist training is to look at waking life as transient, just like a dream is, to look at waking life as temporary and subjective. 
For example, one of the practices that the dream yogis do is called illusory form. And that's to look at things in ordinary life that we would think of as solid, to think of them as more dreamlike. So upon waking in the morning in your waking life, think to yourself, I'm awake in a dream. When you enter the kitchen, recognize it as a dream kitchen. Pour dream milk into dream coffee. The idea is to sort of soften the hardness, the solidity that we normally associate with waking life. Another practice that the Buddhists do is calm abiding. And the idea here is just you want to engage in daytime practices that increase the level of calm in your life. You want to make calm your sort of default emotional state. A successful dream yogi must be stable enough in presence through practices like meditation and other mindfulness practices to avoid being swept away by the winds of karmic emotions and lost in the dream. As you practice this, as the mind steadies, dreams become longer, less fragmented, and more easily remembered, and lucidity is developed. So one way to think of this is by generating a greater sense of calm during the day, it becomes more easy to identify the anxiety. Because the dream, usually in a dream, what will trigger the dream awareness is the awareness that something is out of place. And if anxiety is normally out of place in your waking life, then it becomes more easily, easy to become aware during the dream. Whereas if you have a waking life where you're normally anxious all the time and you're running around like a monkey, then how are you going to distinguish your dream state from your wake state? Because it's all going to be the same thing. So by starting to generate calm as sort of your default emotional state, you'll more often notice the situations that ought to make you aware that you're dreaming. And his final quote here is, to look at, to look at your experience of sleep to discover if you are truly awake. In other words, the more that you are achieving lucidity in your sleep state, that means the more you're seeing through the illusion. You're seeing things as they really are. And that concludes my presentation. So we will have a little bit of a break. And we're going to have, it's not really a Q&A period. It's really more of a, I'm happy to answer any questions you all might have, but also intends it, I intend for this to be an opportunity to share any experiences you have related to dreams or otherwise that you think might be relevant to the topic. And so we'll take what about usually about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and we'll, we'll regroup. Thank you very much.
And as did Paul Foley, yeah. Mm -hmm. And in my encounters, I've always like, hugged them and embraced them and given them love, but there was no right. dissolution into the right. meat. And I don't think the dissolution is a necessary element. In other words, I think that's just a, it's a symbolic thing where they're accepting and absorbing that energy. But if you're opening up a dialogue with a dream figure, if you're not, as Charlie Morley says, if you're not running away, if you're not waking yourself up and you're not getting into a fight with the figure, well, then you're making progress. You're starting to open up a channel of communication with the shadow. You're starting to accept the shadow. And it is not, some of the examples we gave were somewhat dramatic where it all happened in one dream. But in my experience, it's actually, it tends to be I get these recurring dream figures and it's, it's, I make steady progress where initially I can't even approach the figure and then slowly I start to open up a dialogue. So I haven't myself had the experience of like absorbing an energy the way they described, but I think it's possible to do that. Go ahead. Um, I was to say also with the astral stuff that there are a lot of similarities. Mm -hmm. So like um, uh, when I was four, I used to have an astral dream that gnomes would come and kidnap me and would take me to their village. And so I became really scared to go mm -hmm. to sleep at night. And so one night I decided I'm going to make friends with them this mm -hmm. time. Good. Or like sometimes the, the astral figures show up in ways that you can see them just like in dreams. They're like symbols mm -hmm. almost. So like if you yeah. pay attention to how the astral yeah. beings look, I mean they don't look like anything. They're not physical. So they're just looking like you're making them look. Yeah, my impression is like yours is that the astral experience is it's a dynamic psychological environment just like a dream is. Right. Yeah. Yes. Heather, you had a question? One of, my, one of my many shadows. But yeah. it was like your magical side. Yes. How did you come to that conclusion? Because that's what I'm having a problem mm -hmm. with, is identifying my shadow figures and what they mm -hmm. mean and represent me. Right. So how did you come to that? I think it's, it's, for me, it's an intuitive thing. So, like, no one has, there's no dream dictionary that's going to tell me that Sammy Hagar represents my inner rock star, right? right. But I've... <laughs> I've ex I have declared that Sammy Hagar is my inner rock star, and I'm wearing the red shirt, right? So, so that's a shadow. In other words, the shadow, this is a misunderstanding of the shadows. We tend to think of the shadow as a negative energy or element. And sometimes, sometimes it's something we fear, but there's almost always a golden flip to it. There's always the initial fear is like we, are, we have belief systems going on, and so our belief system is registering fear, negative, whatever like that. But it's just we're, we're mistranslating the energy. Usually behind that negative object is something golden. There's some, there's some potential for us that's not yet manifested, that's not yet been illuminated in our life. Um, so maybe part of the hang-up, it's your dream and you are the dreamer. I'm just saying if it were my dream, if I was hijacking your dream, I would play around with the idea, well, maybe to think about, try to put a more positive spin on this, on this shadow figure. Because maybe if, you're, if you're, you're hunting specifically for a negative meaning and it's not revealing itself, it's because it's, it's yeah, not. None of my shadow figures are, are I, except for that one that I shared with you, <laughs> mm -hmm. but all the rest of them, my shadow figures, they're not, they're not menacing. I'm not scared of them. Good. Mm -hmm. That's okay. You, you, I don't think you need to figure them out in one fell swoop. In other words, if, I, always, I would say don't worry about it because if it's important, it'll come back again. I mean, we see this with the recurring nightmares. In each of those cases, I think there's something important going on in the psyche of the person having the experience. and be, It becomes a recurring nightmare because it's something, un, something that's very important that's still unresolved. Mm -hmm. it, them. Yeah, you could also, you could also dialogue and ask them, yeah. Yeah, so that's, <laughs> yeah, yeah the, this is maybe practice, you know, read some of the books on lucid dreaming. If you can start to play around with that idea, that might give you the opportunity to ask an open-ended question, yeah. not to control the dream, but to let that dream figure speak for itself. Mm -hmm. I'll let Nancy go, then I'll come back to you. Well, Carl Jung might say, uh, try active imagination. And right. Mm -hmm. 
Alan, you're... Oh, uh, I was going to say, look, Fritz Perls uh, has written about that and uh, uses that in groups and also with individuals. And that is the bridge between you and the shadow figure is your imagination. So you have to create that energy yourself to imagine being that person, that thing. Uh, client that I was working with most recently, I asked him to be this apartment of his dream. And his words afterwards were, I couldn't imagine those words coming out of my mouth. So, um, you have to give up your ego. Thank you. What's that? Do you have a question? No. Betsy, you have something? Okay. Well, it's seven o'clock. Should we wrap things up? You think, or okay? Well, do we have any other announcements before we wrap up? Or. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Yeah. Thank you. All.